Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday. It is beautiful here in Hollywood, California. I hope it's wonderful where you are as well. Today, we have a very special show. I'm so excited. I mean, I am so, so excited for the guests we have on the show. Rarely do you have um, a, a, a daughter of royalty stopping by the Sherrard Show, um, but we have that tonight. Um, from the legendary Bumps Blackwell, we do have his wonderful, beautiful daughter, Kelly Lee Blackwell. She stopped by the show. We're going to be talking to her in one moment. But first, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio, where you can listen to the greatest episodes of the Sherrard Show if you miss them on Essence Television. You just go simply add the app to your um, device, your smart device, so you can watch it on your television and listen to the greatest episodes of your life from the Isley Brothers, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, Manhattans, as well as Kelly Lee Blackwell. That's gonna be on <laughs> iHeartRadio as well. You don't wanna miss that one. And then also it's brought to you by the Essence Wear Apparel. You can see right on your monitor. We have Essence Wear Apparel t-shirts um, as well as the shoe collection. So if you want a part or own a part of the uh, Sherrard Show as well as Essence Wear, you can just go ahead and click on a link or cash app me at the Sherrard Show right on your monitor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to hits, when it comes to hearing the Ray Charles, the Quincy Jones, the Lloyd Price, Sam Cooke, Herb Albert, Larry Williams, and even the Sly and the Family Stone, they had to have started somewhere. And there is a man there was a man that was a hit maker. He was a songwriter. He was also an arranger as well as a producer. And again, he's produced some of the biggest hits that we sing today. And for those who don't know him, you're going to learn about him tonight. And for those who <laughs> do know him, you're going to be reacquainted. That's the legendary Mr. Bumps Blackwell. Well, his beautiful daughter has stopped by the Sherrard Show, keeping his legacy alive. And she's come by the Sherrard Show to give a few minutes of her time to talk about her dad in his wonderful life. Well, welcome, Kelly. How are you? Thank you so much. How you doing? Thank you for having me here. I'm so excited to have you on. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get a close shot, close up a shot of that shirt. It says, just the vinyl girl. People who Learn don't know much. Digital world. Mercy. <laughs> so, so tell me, Kelly, what is, tell the youngsters what that shirt means. Well, um, I truly love vinyl. You know, I love the the old pops and snaps and cracks and stuff. And since we're in a digital age, that's why I saw this shirt. I was like, just a vinyl girl living in a digital world. I'd rather go buy vinyl than download this and download that. I just like the original, it's a pure form of the music. You know, and I just love the scratches. It just seems truly, truly authentic. Oh, you are, you preaching already. You started early preaching. Do I need to get the collection <laughs> plate already? She is preaching early. You know, vinyl, people don't realize there was a sound that the artist was trying to portray in vinyl that they portrayed so well that CDs just can't touch. Is that correct? That's right. You know, it's just, it's so clear on a CD, you know, and it's just, it just really seems, yeah, it's perfect on a CD, but on vinyl, it just has a totally different vibe to it. You know, it's, I can just always see like my father in a recording studio recording a song when I listen to vinyl because of because of the mechanics that goes into it, you know, the stopping of the tape, you know, stop here, let's do it again, you know, to let's re-record it. I can just see yes. that in my mind when <laughs> you know, I listen to his music or anyone's music, you know, that I have. I have like Miles Davis, Cannonball Adderley, you know, the coasters. So I can always picture that as opposed to a CD. It's just like this transferring this and there's nothing to it. There's no, to me, it's like there was love put into putting it on vinyl. On a CD, you just transferring, but on vinyl, that's love. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, that's wonderful you say that, Kelly, because it's sometimes um, when I was a kid listening to records like the 45s and 78s, it had a pitiful sound to it, but it was beautiful. It was a beautiful, pitiful sound because you would hear the cracking and everything starting. So I get it. I absolutely get it. She's a vinyl girl. Now, now yes, let's I talk would. about um, your dad, first and foremost. Okay. Tell us a little bit about who was Mr. Bumps Blackwell? Well, he was a fantastic arranger and producer and musician in his own right. He was um, the a and man for specialty in Los Angeles, but his music career started in Seattle, Washington, where he was born. It started in the 40s. 
And while he was doing music, he had um, a cab stand and a butcher stand, you know, to, to work as his jobs. But on, as, on his side gigs were, were music. He had a couple um, orchestras. He had the Bums Blackwell Junior Band, the Bums Blackwell Band, the Bums Blackwell Orchestra. And one of the orchestras that I, I consider them all orchestras to, to me, you know, Quincy Jones, when Quincy was 14 years old, he was my father's trumpet player. And Ray Charles was my father's piano player. So all three of them, you know, were friends and, you know, came up in this music industry. And Quincy Jones, my dad and Jimi Hendrix all went to the same high school at different times, Garfield High in Seattle. And Jimmy actually eventually ended up working with my dad with Little Richard. You know, um, now before we get started, people are going to be asking this question, so we got to deal with it right away. When you look at your, when you look at your dad, very good looking guy, had smooth skin, everything, but yet they called him Bumps. So why did they call him Bumps Blackwell? <laughs> Daddy got that nickname because he would get into a lot of fights and he would lose all the time. So, <laughs> You know, it just became a nickname for him. He would just come home beat up, you know, so they just started calling him Bumps and it just stuck and it just became, you know, a true part of him, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's just, it, now it's just a loving term, you know, that people refer to him as, you know, and I refer to myself as Baby Bumps. That's you know, beautiful. Here, you know, <laughs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> now, now um, with him, now most people know um, that your dad produced Sam Cooke. Um, but yes. you were just mentioning Ray Charles. He started, he kickstarted the career of Ray Charles. Also, Little Richard, you know, he produced yes. Tutti Fruity and so many mm -hmm. other songs of him, Sly and the Family Stone. Now, um, your dad passed away in 1985. You were still very young. Now, tell us a little bit about what was it like growing up with your dad around the house? Well, you know, I lived here in New Orleans. My mom came back a year after I was born. I was born in Los Angeles. And my mother is from here. And, you know, it's, their story is, is very cute to me because he was here in 56 recording Little Richard at J&M on Rampart Street. And he was, Mariscalco was staying next door to my mom and he heard her singing. She was in a bathtub and he heard her singing and he asked her to come do an audition, to, well, to audition for her, for him. And she did an Elvis impersonation, which I just cringe when I kind <laughs> of... When I think about that and it was like six months later they got married and um she ended up moving to Los Angeles you know to, over you know to be with him and I didn't come around till 67 but in 68 she came back so I would go back and forth and daddy would come back here because he was still working you know in the music industry and he had to do stuff here and so I would go over there, you know, back and forth. So it was just always stuff going on in the households, wherever, if I was in Los Angeles, there was musicians for days there, you know, you wake up and they got people sleeping here. You don't even know them, you know, but if you were involved with my father musically, that was the house to stay in. You know, that's the same thing happened with Sam Cooke. And when you come down here, it's the same exact thing, you know, because that's just how he worked. And that was just his lifestyle. So, you know, it didn't even phase me. I was just so used to it. Now, how it was, was he as a person? He was, everybody was a student to him. You know, he saw everyone as a student. He was a very kind man, um, but he could be frustrated because after closer to my teenage years, he went, he was legally blind. Oh, wow. And so um, things were tougher for him because he didn't, he didn't have patience while he could see, but once he lost his sight, he had no patience at all. So he couldn't see what you were doing to help him. He just wanted it right then and there. So he was very stern, but he was a good man and he was kind and he was loving and he was very funny. But he also wanted to instill, you know, values and to make sure that you learned what you came to learn. And he was very serious about it. And if you didn't want to do it, he wasn't going to waste his time, you know, with you. And that's how he, you know, brought me up to be, you know, I'm going to teach you how to do this and to do this and to be this way. But he was, you know, philosophical in, in his little ways. And, but he was very funny, but he was also very serious. He would teach me how to cook. Even though he was blind, he would teach me how to cook. So I just, you know, he was just a really good father. I'm, I'm very proud and thankful, you know, that I'm his child, you know, and I get to carry his name. And Marlene 
Marlene's child, you know, <laughs> and I'm just happy to be able to carry that name and to do the things I do for him. Wow. Now, now um, with him, you know, he's worked with so many notable people, but did he yeah. speak much about Sam Cooke to you when you were, when you were around or who did he speak much about? Well, um, he spoke with David Tannenbaum, who wrote the book You Send Me, or co-wrote it, who's helping me with a book. You know, so everybody's got to kind of wait and see with that. But did, he had a good interview. Um, he spoke, you know, with um, David a lot about it because it speaks a lot about um, my father with Sam in his book. Daddy didn't really talk too, too much with me because I was still kind of young. And I think how I felt about it when we did talk about it, he was just very mm, not too much about it because I think it hurt him when Sam died, you know, cause he saw so much potential and they had done so much and created a beautiful sound and put out wonderful music, you know, and had done so much work. You know, my father did so much to get Sam Cook to go from gospel to secular. You know, my daddy worked on this man for eight months to get him to get out of gospel because he knew he had it. And so when he died, I think um, a part of my father sort of went with it, you know, and um, he, I think he only spoke to certain people about it. And I, I think a lot of times my father was like, I, don't, I just wanna shelter my child and shield her from this. He didn't really show me that kind of hurt in him because he was very strong, he was very prideful. You know, he was a proud man and um, I didn't see any weakness in him, you know, or sadness in that respect, you know, but I just saw how, I think that was something that really hurt him when Sam passed, mm -hmm. you know, but I, they had a really good relationship. My father went to extreme lengths to get this man to be the star that he still is you know, even though he's no longer with us, you know, Sam is just, he's an incredible artist and his music is, re it really is, it's timeless, it's classic, you know, it's just everywhere. Hey man, but, and, and it's, a, it's amazing you say that um, because, you know, Sam, uh, Bumps took, your dad took Sam from um, Keen and brought him over to Specialty and took him no, from, uh, uh, the other, other way. way around. Yeah, Sam, they were at Specialty and, and my father ended up, my, my father got fired because from what I've been told, they, um, they were recording You Send Me and Art Roop wasn't supposed to be there at the studio. And for some reason, Art came in that day and he didn't like the fact that my father was using white backup artists behind Sam Cooke. And my father ended up getting fired, but the to take Sam, my father had to give up his future royalties to Little Richard. And so they went right up the street to, to King Records and, and cut you send me. You wow. know, so it, you know, it, but I think my father was like, whatever, I'm fine with it. You know, because I yeah. know I got a hit, I got a hit on my hands right here. <laughs> so I'm yeah, like, oh, um, you know. that is amazing because uh, art didn't see the kind of potential Sam had like Bumps did, like your dad. Your dad really saw the maximum potential and he maximized his potential because You Send Me was the biggest hit uh, that your dad did with Sam, but he also produced other ones by Sam Cooke, like Chain Gang and things like that. Is that correct? He did Everybody Loves the Cha-Cha-Cha and he produced Love You Most of All. And it's his orchestra on the, you know, on, on these songs and stuff like that. And then, you know, eventually they parted ways. Um, Sam went to RCA, then ended up with SARS, but they were working their way back together you know, to start working, you know, together again, but then, you know, Sam was tragically killed. Right, correct, correct. Well, now, um, for you, are you as musically gifted as your dad? Um, I play a little piano, I sing a little. I've been, when my dad would have a show or two, I would be in his shows, you oh. know, and I'm going to tell you, you know, Mel Carter, I love Mel Carter. That's my good friend, Mel. Yeah, he was um, in a show, my father's show, called Portraits in Bronze featuring Bessie Griffin, the gospel singer, because my father was her manager and produced Portraits in Bronze, the album. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to talk with Mel one day and he says, oh yeah, I love your father. And he says, I was in your father's show, Portraits in Bronze. And I was like, I'm just so connected with all these people. Wow, you know? wow. And my it's mother was also a gospel pearl behind Bessie Griffin on the Portraits in Bronze album. 
Mm-hmm. But now, I now sing a far- little and I play a little piano and a little guitar and a little drum. Now, something else, now, now, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are just joining us, we are speaking to the iconic daughter of uh, Bums Blackwell, Mr. <laughs> Bums Blackwell, Kelly Blackwell. Can't you tell to see the resemblance? She's very, very <laughs> talented, um, doing big things. One thing you you were mentioning that you also do, which is a full-time job, is manage your dad's catalog. Is that correct? Yeah. I, no. um, you know, I put it out for licensing, you know, and companies come to me you know, wanting to license his music, but I always make sure that it's good and that it's in something good because I just don't want it to be used for any old thing, you know, because his music deserves to be in everything that's good. In fact, um, I love the people who I'm, who are in my circle or starting to be in my circle. I was watching the movie Green Book about Dr. Don Shirley. And I saw one of my father's songs in there. I didn't even know it was in there that he had produced. And somebody hit me up, Kelly, you know, your father's song is in there, a song that he produced. You what know, song was that? It was called Rich Woman and um, by Lil Millette and the Creoles. And, you know, as I go through this journey, I'm learning so much more about my father that I didn't know, you know, about the music that he's done and the people who he's worked with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are people who are more versed in this than I am and who've been, who are, who've been in the music industry for years. So they have a you know better outlook on it and stuff in the sense of knowing more musically. So they've been teaching me and and kind of guiding me through this process that I'm in and on this journey, which is fantastic to me. That's a beautiful thing. You know, one person has worked with your dad. You may not know his name is Jim Gilstrap. He was uh, he's a member of the Originals. He is the guy that sings the hook for uh, Good Times. He's a really good friend of mine as well. Really? Him and Mel Carter were on the show together. But he tells a story about how Bumps, your dad, called him to um, perform. They were going to perform behind Sam Cooke um, in Tokyo. And he got the call. The next day, they were going to go into rehearsal. But Jim was walking past Figueroa, and he saw the police bringing the body out. Didn't know that was Sam Cooke to the next day. But your dad contacted Jim Gilstrap to perform with Sam Cooke, and he was going to perform with him in Tokyo, but he died the next day. My father, my mother, my uncle Leslie, and his wife Janice, they were with Sam the night he died. Really? And, at, at, at Martoni's or PJ's? Um, I think maybe it was at PJ's. It was a little cafe. Mm-hmm. And my father was trying to, you know, he was, whatever Sam was trying to do, my father was trying to tell him, don't go, just stay. You know, because it was a good night and they were talking and, you know, I think they had really remained friends, even though they had parted ways musically for that short time. And my father was trying to tell him, please don't leave, you know, because my father just felt something was just not right. You know, and Sam just, I guess, just like to get up and go and whatever he was going to do. And then later on, they got the call that, you know, he was killed. In fact, my uncle, Leslie Milton, he's a drummer. Um, He's played, you know, with. Quincy Jones and my dad and with Charles Wright and the 103 Watts band, you know, he was there with his, with his wife and sat, I talked to him a lot about it. And he was like, you know, I just couldn't, couldn't believe what, that I got a call later on saying that Sam was killed and we were just there with him. You, you know, know, it's interesting you say that. Um, I actually did a, um, it, it, it started airing yesterday, actually on Essence Television, as well as on um, my YouTube channel. Um, is featuring BG Rule and it's who really murdered Sam Cooke. So it's really talking about detail about um, what really happened. And then also one thing that's interesting is you're speaking about it. You know, Lana Rawls was a guest on the show um, and she was right. speaking about, she was speaking about how Sam stopped by um, her house to see Lou, Lou Rawls and to get right. him to want to come out to Martoni's. But um, Lou turned it down because him and her were going to go to the movies and they're going to get up early and go to Redondo Beach. But Lou regretted that because at three in the morning, they got the call. Yeah. Well, you know, Daddy had worked with Lou Rawls also. Um, he, my dad worked with a group called The Travelers, and they had a song called Teenage Miss Age. And I think another, the flip side was Why. And then when it went to gospel, it was the Pilgrim Travelers with Lou Rawls in it. So, you know, all these people are so connected, 
Very, very you know. much so. And you you help keep it in alive. I'm so honored and beautiful to know that you're keeping it live. You know, I, I actually was um, on the show, one of my show, I was searching for someone who knew Bumps Blackwell or who was related. And here comes this beautiful lady, Kelly Blackwell, his very <laughs> own daughter. Now, speaking of beauty, um, you are a baby doll. Is that correct? I am a baby doll here in New Orleans. Um, I'm Tell a everybody baby. what's a baby doll. <laughs> okay. They started back in 1912. And um, when they started out, some of the ladies were prostitutes because it was really during like Jim Crow era where men could not, their husbands couldn't get um, jobs. So the women went out and prostituted. It started like in Storyville. You know, when men would come in, they would go to these prostitutes. Well, there's a, there was a white section and a black section, which was black Storyville and there was Storyville, which was the white area. Um, but that's how it really started. Not all of them, but some were. And they would wear like little short skirts and bonnets. And they would have, you know, like a little umbrella. Some of them would carry sticks as protection. They got the name because the men who, you know, they had a pimp. And so the pimp started calling them baby dolls. And that's how it really got its name. But, you know, it's evolved over the years. And then they became a part of Mardi Gras. They would be a part of, you know, well, New Orleans was really segregated for a very long time. Black people couldn't be involved in Mardi Gras. That was for whites. So we had Carnival, which was the area that my mother grew up in on St. Bernard and Tonti and Claiborne. And so the baby dolls would come out with there. Then all of a sudden, as years went on, Mardi Gras became integrated. So we come out for Mardi Gras and we come out little short skirts with an umbrella you know, our fans, and we second line, we dance, you know, we're part of New Orleans culture, along with the Indians and second liners, you know, we're an integral part of New Orleans, you know, so we're, we're everywhere. We're seen, you know, on billboards, we're at parades, events with the mayor, whomever, you know, we're always encouraging people to do the right thing, you know, in New Orleans, we're community oriented, um, we do community service, but we also have a good time now, you know. So. But, but let's make sure we clear the air before all, all my questions start popping up from my listeners and viewers. You're not, but you, today you're not a prostitute. No, it's just you've evolved. So <laughs> I want to make sure we get that no, correct because people are going to be asking no, me that. That was, that was back then. You know, all these women are, prof are professional career oriented women, but that is just a history. And I see it as you know, if you're going to tell the story, you tell the story. Because okay. if you don't, someone else will. You're not going to get it. And I don't see the shame in it because, you know, I see it as they were empowered. They had to do what they had to do in order to take care of their families, just like people have to do today. You know, so it's part of our history. And, you know, but it has truly evolved into a spectacular organization. You know, I got to give a shout out to all my baby doll sisters. Um, I'm with the original Black Seminole Baby Dolls. And I go by Baby Bumps or Baby Doll Bumps, you know, very so. Good, very good, now, um, now, Now, for you, um, you're, you and your dad, were you mixed with Creole and Indian or what? Yeah, Black, Creole, French, Native American. Um, Bumps' mother, um, she was Cherokee. So I'm a, my, I have a friend here, he calls me Gumbo. He says, because okay. Kelly, you just me. <laughs> He said, you just mix it, everything, baby. <laughs> wow, wow. Now, now let's speak about your mom for a minute. Now, um, did your mom speak much about Sam Cooke and all of the artists that your dad um, had produced over the years? Because I'm sure she met him, correct? Yeah, she, well, she was around at the time. They were married, at, my mother and father were married at the time daddy was working with Sam. And, you know, she said she would, like, just as a child growing up, you know, when I would see him, she said she would get up, there would be people in her, in her sleeping in her bathtub, <laughs> but you go in the bathroom there's people sleeping in the bathtub in the kitchen on the floors in all the rooms of the house wherever she went there were people and so she was involved in that in fact my parents got married December 16th 1956 in St. Bernard Parish here you know in Louisiana my father left the wedding and went back to finish the recording session at J&M and then when he finished that, then they ended up having a reception. That's why he said he could always remember his wedding date to my mother because he had to go finish a recording session. So she was very much a part of that. Like with Lou Adler was around, Sam, 
um, Elsie Cook. He used to call her Little Mama. He said because she was his Little Mama. Okay. Uh -huh. Wow. And he said because she was. Go ahead. No, go ahead with your thought, young lady. And since so she was just, you know, a very nice person, and she was, you know, she was, she was also a dancer. She made a recording of "My Baby Loves the Western Movies." You know, the Olympics did that song. Mm -hmm. She did a version on, I think it's NSYNC label. And she was also in 1958. She was the Jet Beauty of the Week, February oh, wow. 13, 1958. And she, <laughs> she was only 22 years old. And you know, Bumps was 18 years older than she was. And she told me one time, she said, when we were doing that shoot, she said, Kelly, as the cameraman was watching me, Bums was watching the cameraman. I said, I completely understand. Wow. Now, now um, your mom is no longer with us? Yeah, both my parents are deceased. Oh, OK. OK, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm so we are speaking to the lovely Kelly Blackwell. Such an honor to have her on the Sherrard Show. We will take your questions in a moment, but I got a one question for you, and then we'll start. We'll open up the questions for this lovely lady. Now, um, Kelly, so with your dad um, and all of his accomplishments, um, how were you able to really put all this together? Because we were speaking about him not winning a Grammy. I never knew he never won a Grammy. But how are you able to put it together so we can get together and get your dad a Grammy for all of his wonderful producing and songwriting over the years? Well, I read a lot about him. Um, I have a lot of his stuff, like articles. Um, I have people who are helping me also. I have some pictures of him. Um, I buy as much of his music as I can buy you know, so that I, I know what he's done. And um, I'm in contact with people who he's still work, who he's worked with, you know, even though he's passed, they're still around. And um, so they teach me also. And people are, into, you know, have said, you know, we want to help you do this and do that. Like get the Grammy, you know, get him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That is correct. That is, that's exactly the goal um, for him. You know, you know, so um, because, and I, I don't, I'm going to interject this for a minute. You know, Sam, in a lot of books you read, um, you read about in Sam's career, you know, he worked with your dad, Bumps Blackwell, Lou Adler. He also worked with um, Art Rupi, but also you see Renee Hall. Renee Hall and your dad worked together in a few projects re with regards to Sam. Were you able to ever meet Renee Hall? I was never able to meet him, you know, but I see pictures of Renee with Sam and stuff. I, I'm still searching for pictures between Renee and my father. You know, but I do have the ones with Herb Albert with my dad and Sam in the recording studio, a very young Herb Albert, you know. Um, so these are the things that, you know, helped me compile this information on my father because I was really young when he was, well, I wasn't even born when Sam, Sam died before I was born. So it's me just gathering information, you know, about my father and during the time with Sam. You know, I was, I've been around with Richard for forever. He was at the hospital with my dad the day I was born. So, you know, he's really more my uncle than just little Richard, you know, he's family to me. I've known him, well, he's known me since I was born. So I've always had that connect to him, you know, so it's just, and I, I've learned so much, through, you know, from him with my dad, I would, they would, they would allow me to sit in meetings with them as a little person. I didn't know what they were talking about, but they allowed me to sit in. And so that was good because I got to see my, my father, you know, in action and, you know, taking care of business. And when he would take me to the recording studios with him, you know, and to just to listen to people and he would just teach me how to do this, that and the other, you know, so I have that, that's, you know, that memory of, of my father. So I'm able to put that on paper, you know, said so others will know who he was so they can see what I see. Very good, very good. Well, we're going to take some questions now. They're blowing up. Uh, we're going to take some questions for Kelly Blackwell, again, the daughter of the iconic Bumps Blackwell. Now, this question, um, this question is from Michael. This is from Michael. He's all, all the way in San Antonio. He says, we're honored to have you on the show. He's a huge fan of your dad and all his, hook, his hits. He says he didn't know your dad had written so many hits or produced for so many people. But his question to you is, do you want to see records come back, LPs, or you find the way it is, everything digital? I would love for vinyl to just come back completely. I just think it's the purest form of putting a song out into the atmosphere. 
you know, because I think I really, like I said before, I really think it's love that you're doing, you know, when you're making an LP or 45, you know, CDs, are, that's just like, it's okay. I know CDs are making, starting to make a comeback and cassette tapes I heard are trying to make a comeback. I don't know, but I think vinyl, I think people appreciate that. And people who have a true sense and a love of music, they want the original, you know, and when I go to music stores, I, I like the old stuff. Like, you know, I'd rather get a used album because I can pull it out the sleeve, put it up, check to see if there's scratches. That's how I buy, I, I buy vinyl, you know, but I just think that's the best form of it. And, you know, and it's just, we have all these beautiful turntables that are coming out now. I bought one for Christmas. You know, I have one from Enotris Johnson, who was one of the co-writers for Long Tall Sally. Oh, wow. I helped induct her into the Bogalusa Blues Hall of Fame some years ago before she, right after she died. And I got her, um, her daughter-in-law gave me her turntable and it had the last album she played, which was a gospel album on it. It was left on, you know, in there. So I just really think that's just the way to, to go now. It, that, it's just a big, it's not a fad. I just think that's the way music should be played. If it's not live, I want, I, want a, I want a vinyl. I want I a vinyl. I would agree. Thanks for your question, Michael. This question is from Trish. She's from um, Liberty, Mississippi. Trish's question is, she said, first of all, very pretty lady. And, you're, and we enjoy oh. we enjoy in the conversation on the Sherrard show. Her question is, who was the most fascinating person that your dad worked with that you met? Ooh. Well, it would have to be Little Richard. <laughs> because, you know, he was always a showman. You know, even when he was laid back, he was still a showman and he was very funny, you know, extremely smart, extremely smart, you know, comical. Um, just, it was just his whole demeanor was just so over the top, but yet you could see he was such a sweet and kind person. He, did, know, did, he do, did he do all that woo a lot? All the time, <laughs> whenever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just sitting in the house, he was just doing it and stuff. And I was like, that's what I loved about him because you were always getting Richard, you know, Richard, no matter what. And it was just, it was just something I'm like, when he, he did the eulogy, he gave the eulogy at my father's funeral. When I tell you that was hilarious. Okay. It, it wasn't even hilarious. The whole place was rolling. Everybody was falling out laughing. Why? Because Richard was telling this story about he did this and, he, you know, because he went through that drug phase and stuff like that. He was saying, yeah, I had the cocaine on here. <laughs> I was like, I was just kind of sitting there like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, but it was just something, but it would have been something my father would have appreciated, you know, because that's who Richard was. So that's who you got. You know, good, bad, and different. That's who you got. But so he, was just, he was real. He was real. And I love that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great question, Trish. We got time for one more question here. This is from Alton. Alton, he is from Wyoming. He said, wonderful, wonderful interview. We really are honored. Um, Shiraj never had Miss um, Blackwell on the show. That's correct. That's why it's such an honor. His question is, what can we do to help in voting your dad into getting a Grammy? Well, just the other day, I sent a letter, an email to the Grammy Association regarding my father getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. And someone told me I need to start, I should start a chapter here in Louisiana. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what is the process of it because it's very hard to find even on their website. You know, and, but I would, as soon as I find it, I'll send it to you because I really think it's important for this man to have it. I refuse to watch the Grammys until he gets one. I will I not watch it. I, I will agree. not watch it. I never watched the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Even though I've been there, you know, um, for a function for the American Master Series for uh, Dave Bartholomew and Fats Domino some years ago. And I got to meet people who I didn't never thought I would meet. I met Dave Bartholomew and he was like, I didn't even know Bumps had family. And they were in the studio together when Dave was working with Fats and Daddy was working with Richard. They were at um, j and Studios. I met Robert Parker, who was friends with my father. You know, and I met the Dixie Cups, people who knew my father and Taj Mahal. And I, I mean, it was just 
a wonderful, wonderful thing to meet all these people. So as soon as I know, I'll let you know because I truly believe this man has got to get one. Now he got you. You, know? you got my vote. We're gonna whatever we can do. You reach out to the Sherrard Show. We're gonna definitely get Bumps Good. Blackwell a Lifetime Thank Achievement you. Award as well as a Grammy. And if if it's okay with you, Kelly, I would love to be the one to be there with you to help present it to him. To present sure. it on there, that'll be such an honor because um, for me, and I'll pose this question to you, for me, I love the music of your dad's era in terms of what he produced from the You Send Me's to the Tutti Fruities to all of the things from Lloyd Price, so on and so forth. I love that kind of music. I always joke with my wife and I always say, you know, she asked you, do I know this song? I say, well, if it's past 1979, I don't know it <laughs> because <laughs> from that point on, it's all a blank. I love that. What about you? What you want to know? What about What's your what you era want? of music? Your favorite era of music? Oh my gosh. I'm stuck in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, 80s, a little 90s, some 2000s, but mainly, you know, most of the stuff that's on my net, my little iPod is like 50s type music, you know, along with some, you know, I'm a 70s girl too, because that's the era I grew up with, you know, um, but I'm really into the flamingos and Sam and all the doo-wop stuff. You Amen. Know, just, uh oh, uh oh. I, Amen. I love it. And you know, you know I'm to the seventies with the originals and the Detroit Emeralds. You Amen. Know, oh, you, you wonderful, beautiful taste in music. As a matter of fact, I had the originals on the show. But the thing is that um, if you look at some of my episodes, I always preach the same thing. I am on a mission to bring back the doo-wop and the Jerry Curl. You may not agree with the Jerry <laughs> Curl part, Kelly, but I'm on a mission to bring back the doo-wop. I need your help to bring it back. So please help me bring back the doo-wop and the Jerry Curl. Well, I'll help you with the, with the doo-wop, maybe not so much that Jerry Curl. Wait a minute now, nah, Kelly, you cut that out. Now you gotta go all the way in. Uh, I missed the grease on the wall. Well, Kelly, uh, any final words? Where can your fans be able to keep up with you on Facebook, those who are loving this interview and wanna interact with you? I'm on Facebook, I'm under Kelly Lee Blackwell. You know, um, I'm working on some other things, you know, stay tuned. I'm working on it. You know, I want to tell you, you know, a lot of people don't realize that my father produced for us the Stewart brothers. Um, and when people find that out, they're like, I'm amazed, you know, that your father did that. And, you know, I met George Clinton, P Funk. And he said, Oh, yeah, you know, I met him. And he was like, Yeah. And then he said, You know, I want to tell you, he said, That's when music was music. Thank and you. I didn't really realize he really knew him until I saw an episode of Unsung. And it had him in doo-wop in the parliament. And it just freaked me out. You know, because I just grew up with him from the 70s coming off the mothership, which I'm just like, you know, I just I was so in awe, I could barely speak to him. You know, and he was just like, that's when music was music, when your father was doing it. You know, but people don't realize that he's done work with Sly Stone. And, you know, they just see Sly now but don't realize he had like a doo-wop, you know, era himself back in the fifties and everything, you know? So I'm just always so happy to tell people that, you know, it's just, it's just something to see how much my father has done and the, the, the contribution he's made to this, you know, fabric, the musical fabric in this country, you know, and, you know, worldwide, it's, it's just something. Absolutely it. beautiful. And just to have a piece of history by having this beautiful daughter on the Sherrod Show. Oh, Kelly, sweet. I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show. You've untouched thank so many people, me. informed so many people, and you're going to have a lot more fans, I'm sure, of that, um, who is going to be sporting just a vinyl girl shirt, as well as um, <laughs> joining in joining in with me. And, and you heard her commitment there. It's not a typo. She was saying she's going to help me bring back the doo-wop and a Jerry Curl. We really appreciate that, Kelly. <laughs> I really appreciate you got it, babe. You got it. Thank you so much for being on the show. On our next episode of the Sherrod Show, we're going to have the Barbie twins, ladies and gentlemen. Two attorneys, one verdict. Coming up on our next episode of the Sherrod Show. Make sure you subscribe to our uh, newsletter as well as our Ad Essence Television Network to your Roku or your Amazon device so you can watch this wonderful episode as well as many more. I'm Sherrod. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube videos, subscribe to our newsletter at Essence 
televisionnetworks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrard, you can email him at thesherrardshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.